good evening once again thank you for registering for today's session with the introduction of several industry policies and reforms to enhance ease of doing business india has emerged as a preferred investment destination over the last couple of years today's session on pli for manufacturing of advanced chemistry cells will take you through the insights and guidance on the pli scheme the application process market access to india and decoding the financial and regulatory landscape i now hand over to mohit agarwal md and head multinationals global banking and markets for india and south asia for the opening remarks over to you mohit thank you neeti uh, first of all a big thank you to all of you for joining us for today's session the government of india support for pli has enabled india to secure a visible share of global supply chain disruptions as india pursues an ambitious renewable energy agenda the advanced chemistry cells program will be a key contributing factor to reduce india's green gas greenhouse gas emissions this will be in line with india's commitment to combat climate change with the recently introduced pli for advanced chemistry cells we will see this as fermenting the ground for ev adoption the demand aggregation across sectors is already existing in india with main sectors being consumer electronics electric vehicles advanced electricity grids solar rooftops etc while several companies have already started investing in battery packs the capacities of these facilities are too small when compared to global averages we have not witnessed substantial investment in manufacturing along with value addition of advanced chemistry cells in india the demand for these is currently largely being met through imports the national program on advanced chemistry cell battery storage will reduce this import dependence it will also support the atmanirbhar bharat initiative and sujith from niti ayog will add to this later in the session thank you again for taking your time for this session and i hand it over back to niti thank you mohit uh, i now invite sujith jena senior advisor niti ayog and architect of the acp policy to take us through his views sujit over to you very good evening everyone i hope everyone is doing good and close ones are also doing great amidst the covid thank you hsbc team mohit niti raghav mansi and everyone for organizing such a great organization meeting and everything at a short tenor and i look forward to interacting with people on this national mission on transformative mobility under which the acc program has been approved and i will be sharing the presentation right now please just confirm neeti is it visible or not yes sir it is visible yeah so very good evening everyone now i guess uh everyone is aware of the acc program if someone is not i will just give a brief over it so advanced chemistry cell is the technology which is being uh, if you are aware like batteries are one of the most inherent part of the electric mobility consumer electronics and everything in last 10 and 20 years there have been great growth in worldwide from the emerging economies to the developed nations and batteries has been like giga factories to the tune of 100 to 200 gigawatt has been developed all across the world and still as a country at india we are in a very nascent stage and not able to grab the opportunity like in the past for the semiconductors or the country with the initiative has taken in 2019 where the national mission on transformative mobility was announced for reducing the import dependency at the same time to control the greenhouse gases as stated by mohit in the previous discussion so this program was in conceptualized and recently the cabinet has given the approval for the program for around 18000 crores for a tenor of 5 years as per the 2000 uh, latest guideline which has been released in the pib and the gadget notification is also there in the 
public website for you people to go through. Now, if you see, this is a brief timeline of all the programs which have started, which like the way I stated, the program was conceptualized in March 19 to September 20, where we did all the cost benefit analysis. Then the RFP was launched. In the March 21, we released the cabinet note. And in the May 21, the cabinet note was approved for the ACC program. And we have been continuously having multiple stakeholder discussion like this by HSBC going forward also. And if you see, there is another bracket. If you see, there's a niche ACC program, which we are talking about. And on the niche ACC program, it's something which we are looking forward to new technology where we are trying to grab the opportunity and also push the new investors or the startup people who want to bring a new technology and look into the kind of development in the drone or you use the aircraft manufacturing and everything where it can be utilized. Now I tell you the background of the program, as you're aware, there was a lot of dependency of our country ranging from solar module to mobile phones to lithium ion cells. And last two to three years, there were no policy framework around the lithium ion advanced battery in the country which eventually lead to our dependency on the other nation, mostly China, where 70% we have been importing. Now that was the reason why the need for the ACC program came into the picture. If you see, I have just divided into four major brackets. We wanted to develop the country being self-sufficient and as we are promoting Atman Nirbhar Bharat, self-reliant India. Now we also wanted to not at the same time develop the domestic market, but we wanted to be as good as in the international market so that we are able to export the product as well. It is also a part of our energy security consideration as per the Paris Agreement, where we wanted to control the greenhouse gas emission and everything, and at the same time, depend, reduce our dependency on oil and gas. Now, this is a basic structure or graphical representation of what can be and what if we are with the program and the program is being successfully envisaged and it's being implemented, how the input bill between next seven to eight years is going to be reduced to around 3.5 lakh crore. And if we are going to be dependent on the other nations, China primarily, then the import dependency is never going to be taken away. And at the same time, if you see the import bill can be reduced to 1.7 lakh crore, which come to around 20,000 crores on an annual basis. And the graph is just a pictorial representation of that values. Now, if this slide just talks about how the giga factories across the world are being developed, and as a country, in India, we in India were granny the at the same time. Valuation opportunity for the country. Before this, uh, what I can just go through this is a pie chart which talks about what is the present market breaker across the industry, whether it's from automobile, inverter, e-rickshaw, telecom tower, UPS and others. Now, presently, when the cabinet has approved the program, but at the same time, there were a lot of players who took the initiative themselves and they wanted to develop the lithium ion battery market in the country. So if you see the existing manufacturers are Exicom, Ekman, Delta Electronics, where they're only able to manufacture around 500 megawatts. And there have been few announcement in the past, majorly on the Excite side, Mahindra, Amara Raja, Suzuki, Koshiba, then so most of the people must be aware of, where they're developing one gigawatt to 1.5 gigawatt. Still, we are not able to grab the opportunity where the worldwide opportunity rise between 900 to 1100 gigawatt. We are still in re trying our hard to reach 5 to 10 gigawatt. Now, what we did was like we identified a conservative scenario if year on year basis by 2025, what is going to be a demand creation in the country for a minimum gigawatt opportunity on the ACC side. And we analyze that there is a minimum opportunity of 50 gigawatt year on year by 2025. And there is a potential of with a cumulative capacity of 50 gigawatt immediately. And around 1 billion of investment is expected in this. Now, if I tell you the, the brief contours of the program, the program was a central level fiscal incentive, which has been approved by the cabinet. 
Niti Aayog along with the DHI is going to be the implementation agency for that. There is a subsequent demand where you ICA demand whether it's on the consumer electronics side, electric mobility side, where we are trying to promote the forward and backward integration frame to being a successful part of it. And at the same time, we are trying to promote what you say the ease of doing business, which a country is envisaging towards with a single window approach where the maximum clearances can be provided and a private player will have the comfort on the respective governance and judiciary of the country that they will get minimum time frame to get appointment date and at the same time they will start the construction so that they can be a part of the subsidy or I say the program uh, fiscals next five years. This is a basic slide which talks about what is advanced chemistry cell and what are the major factors which governs advanced chemistry cell majorly on the energy density and cycle life and it is very self-explanatory in nature so I'll not go deep, deep deal into it. Now this is something which is very important for everyone to have a look like for example if I see China and US right now they have everything from the supply chain side whether it's raw material processing, cathode manufacturing, separator manufacturing, electrolyte, anode cell, everything. And in our country, we are only in a very timid space. We are only focusing on the battery packs. But at the same time, we have to be self-reliant. We have to push the program. We have to be as a public and governance side and make sure that we implement it to the rest of the capacity. And I do make it as a so what we have is the graph which shown to reach 20 percent of value addition in next five years and how it can be achieved on a stage-wise basis. Now this is a brief structure how the program is being in a drafted stage, like what are going to be our eligibility conditions. For example, the bidders. The credit worthiness is an important factor. The net worth is going to be a factor which is going to define your credit worthiness. The whole point of being is that, that you should be able to achieve the financial closure and ability to raise the debt and equity in the rightful arrangement so that we're able to achieve the 25% of value addition in the next two years. Now the prospective threshold for individual bidders is around 5 gigawatt hour and where they have to achieve 60% of domestic value addition within five years from the appointment date. Now, there will be a lot of players who are going to be for it and there will be a transparent will be followed as CBS production in India and then we have put a cap of cash subsidy of around 2,000 per kilowatt hour. Then the subsidy provision, as you are all aware, as per the gadget notification, is going to be offered for five years and the maximum award for per beneficiary is going to be 20 gigawatt. And the subsidy will be on the actual sales which you are going to achieve. Then the mechanism of selection will be a standard selection mechanism where the RFP will be done once the bidder gets awarded, LOA will be released. Then there will be a program agreement which gets signed between the central and the state along with the state support agreement with the beneficiary. The to keep a good performance check and at the same time maintain that the kind of output we are receiving has the highest quality standards. We have maintained a robust monitoring and penalty provisions. The penalty is on only on account of the failure of the bidding stage which you have under consider on a QCBS mechanism. I will reiterate again because there is a lot of market downplay that okay we are going to penalize the people who genuinely want to be a prospective bidder. Nothing of that sort. I want to make it clear once again the criteria of a QCBS selection will be openly on the RFP stage where you have to define what you're going to achieve the scale of production with the value capture. If you are not able to achieve those performances, then only the penalty will be applied. And also there is a sufficient cure period which is being provided to all the beneficiaries so that they're able to maintain or reach back to those kind of basic standards which they have committed towards the bidding and get the respective subsidy and the benefits. This is a cash subsidy mechanism. The formula is very clear. The subsidy amount is on the applicable base subsidy, which you will apply on the RFP stage with the value capture, which are going to achieve on a year on year basis. And with the quantum of the cells you've been sold in the market. 
and this is INR per kilowatt with the bonus and the timeline and how the timeline is going to be awarded. Now, these are the key features of the bid documents which are going to be a driving mechanism or going to be the very important part in next five to seven years when the program runs through. There is a program agreement which clearly talks about how the subsidy is disbursed as a framework, how the market demands safeguards are being considered, how is going to be the key concerns of the bidder as well as the government being taken care of, how is the monitoring of the end product is being considered and how there is a sufficient opportunity for both the authority and the beneficiary to safeguard their best of the interest. Now to promote and at the same time, we, what we seen in the past that there is a lot of issues and concerns with the bidders which come to us stating that they are not able to achieve the financial closure or not able to achieve the state to support in the various programs. This is a one of a kind of a program where we are planning to have a state grant challenge and at the same time we want to give sufficient support to the bidder or the beneficiary that okay we want to make this program a success. So we are going to make sure that there is a model state support agreement get executed between the center state and the beneficiary where they are able to get trunk infrastructure facility at the ease and able to get the appointed date at the earliest and start manufacturing. There will be a robust framework with upfront clearances and with the single window clearance mechanism, which I spoke to you in the past. And then will be a standard RFP stage, which I spoke about. Now that this is the way forward, it is a very important slide. I would like everyone to have make the right way, choice into it, understand it clearly so that when they come during the bidding stage, there will be less of the questions and queries to be discussed. As you are aware, there will be a 50 gigawatt manufacturing facility under the ACC program and then there is a 5 gigawatt as a niche ACC technology. There will be a transparent bidding mechanism under QCBS. Minimum the bidders can bid for a 5 gigawatt, maximum being 20. The 25% of value addition has to be achieved within two years from the appointed date itself. And there is a 60% value addition to be achieved within five years. Now, what I have done, I have defined the ERY subsidy, which is being clearly mentioned in the gadget notification as well. Right now, this is the stage-wise process which we are going to, which right now NITI and DHI are under. So we have received the cabinet approval on May 2021. Then government called for the bidding, it's in progress. We are drafting the document. It will be launched in the market in next one month, I believe. And then we are going to get go for a bid evaluation and the successful bidders are going to be announced and there will be a program agreement and the state support agreement being signed. And the project will start straight away with the appointed date being awarded. And then there will be regular monitoring and project milestones to be disbursed as per the cash subsidy by DHI. Now, this is something which is very new, which we are also promoting a lot that there will be a lot of state grant challenge framework opportunity where we'll be becoming a kind of a mid player or kind of support between center state and the manufacturer. We are going to bring all the state senior representatives, secretaries and everyone and put it directly for the beneficiary to discuss and talk about the various kind of facilities and provision they would like to have with the respective states and they are free to decide which state they want to go for. And this all from my side, I will hand over to Mansi or I need to take it forward. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sujit. Thanks for that session. Before I move on to the next panelist, I just want to uh, mention that we'll be taking on Q&A at the end, but you can put in your questions in the Q&A section on the webinar. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd now like to invite Saurabh Agarwal, uh, partner tax and regulatory on Stan Young to take on the next topic. Saurabh, over to you, please. Sure. Thanks, Neyati. So a uh, very good evening to all the participants for this conference and thank you for taking out time to attend the session. Uh, I'm extremely thankful to HSBC for inviting me for this particular session and the uh, Niti Aayog team uh, to give a brief overview around the PLI scheme. So I'll not be talking much around the PLI because I think uh, Sujit from Niti Aayog has primarily covered the PLI piece. What I'll be talking about, so while PLI is the buzz of the town, what we at EY call it as a CapEx growth agenda or CapEx incentives agenda. So while central government is facilitating something called as production linked incentive scheme, uh, which uh, Sujit talked about, there are two other schemes also of both center and state government, which are of paramount importance because all these three schemes put together 
lead to a clawback or a cashback of 75% and it can go up to as high as 168% or 200% of the plant and machinery investment which you are doing in India. So overall, while you continue to gain your profits from the normal business which you do, but Indian government is ready to give you a cash back in the form of multiple of these particular schemes. Now, if we look at PLI scheme, while of course, Sujit and Niti did talk about 2000 rupees per kilowatt, the effective incentives given that it will be a bidding system multiplied and 2000 multiplied by value addition, multiplied by discounting factor, you'll land up getting somewhere close to INR 500 to INR 700 per kilowatt hour on the sales which you'll be making in India or export sales from India. Overall, you can look at a clawback of around 35 to 40 odd percent of the total investment which you're making in plant and machinery from the PLI scheme. Moving to the second scheme is the state industrial policy. This is very, very important. While, uh, P while the central government is talking about that they'll facilitate a tripartite agreement, it becomes very, very important for each of the industrialists to specifically go back to the state where they want to invest and thereafter start the negotiation process with the state government to get the incentives from the state. So each state in India today is fighting for the investment and trying to attract the investor into their state. And primarily, if I look at the states which are closer to ports, it can be Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Gujarat, Maharashtra. And of course, if I have to add some of the auto cluster uh, and, uh, as a dry state, it can be Haryana as well. So overall, some of those states which may be relevant for you, you can look at a subsidy in the form of a gross SGST refund. You can look for a capital subsidy ranging from 10% to 25% of the investment which you are making in the state. And guys, another important point for you, if you see the recent news, we have been watching out where in Tamil Nadu is even talking about a 40% capital subsidy to one of the investors. So 40% capital subsidy of your investment made is a really big number, which can improve upon the IRR of your project. Concessional land, stamp duty exemption, part tariff concession. So all these put together, and of course, there will be other ancillary incentives in the fiscal form and non-fiscal form, which can give you an overall clawback of 25 to 150% of the investment which you are making into the state, depending upon the, your choice of the state and depending upon the supply chain pattern which you are looking at. So really, really a great incentive packages which are being offered by the state governments at this particular moment of time. What is important is how will you plan your negotiation strategy? These are all customized packages. So you need to go back to the state government and negotiate very hard where you need to develop your negotiation strategy in the form of calculating what is the contribution of your project to the state government in next 20 years, both in direct terms and in indirect terms in case of ancillaryization happening. What is the overall contribution which the state government is getting from the employment as well? Because as you pay the employee, employee will spend that particular money into the state and the state will get uh, revenues in the form of GST, which is paid by the employee on buying any goods or services within that particular state. So overall, calculating direct contribution to the state government and indirect contribution as well to the state government becomes very, very important. And thereafter, looking at the wish list of incentives which you have, also looking at what are the neighboring states offering and what are the auto cluster states offering for a similar size of project when you are going for these negotiations. So, uh, so what you need to do is you need to do your homework properly when you are negotiating upon these incentives with the state government. An important point to remember, once you have negotiated with the state government, renegotiation with the state government becomes very tough. So in case you are signing a tripartite agreement after you get awarded with the PLI scheme and you sign up with the particular state, it will become very difficult for you to move out from that state. So start your negotiation pro uh, process as soon as possible. Coming to the last scheme in my pillar is the manufacturing and other operations in bonded warehouse regulation scheme 2019. It's a scheme launched in October 2019, similar to that of EOU and exactly a replica, I can say. The only best advantage about this scheme is EOU asks you to do a net foreign exchange earning. Under this scheme, you are not required to do any net foreign exchange earning. Your BCD on capital goods is getting deferred, which is around approximately 8.25%. And your GST is also getting deferred on capital goods, imported capital goods, if I have to say or 19.5%, even if I take a time value of money saving for three years out of there, it will be around 
broadly around three. Uh, you can add three percent of your capital goods savings over there. So three percent plus eight point two five percent net saving will be somewhere close to eleven point two five percent. So those are some broad details. Of course, I have put in slides uh, around each of these these schemes. Some important features which I like to highlight around the PLI, which becomes very vital, and I have been hearing from the industry. And of course, that question I am sure will come to Sujit at some point of time. Value addition of sixty percent. When I speak to my clients, when I speak to industry, what I'm hearing is achieving a 60% value addition even in five years' time will be a challenge, given that cathode and many other raw materials are not available in India. So again, I'll not talk much about this particular part. Maybe I'll uh, leave that particular question open. Maybe will come somewhere or the other from the uh, attendees today uh, for Sujit to answer that particular question as to what is. His views around the same. The second important aspect in the PLI is around the damage clause. So while of course the current performance bank guarantee clause in itself is a, uh, you can say it's a very big number of performance bank guarantee which is being asked for, which is estimated uh, committed investment multiplied by five percent multiplied by value addition, which is approximately around one fifty odd crores as a PBG which is being asked, and then to further add to it is the. Clause around the value addition not being achieved or the committed scale of production not being achieved as a retrenchment clause. Of course, I believe that this retrenchment in all cases is merely reducing the subsidy amount, and it will not uh, mean that you need to, as an investor, you need not pay back to the government in case you are unable to meet this particular uh, value additions or committed scale of production amounts as far as this formula on the screen is concerned. But again, I'll keep it open for uh, maybe uh, Niti Aayog team to comment upon this particular part. Of course, I did talk about mover uh, at a very high level. Uh, the overall savings is around 24.96% in terms of cash flow saving. The direct PNL saving can be somewhere close to 11, 11 and 11 and a half percent under this scheme. Estate incentives, I did talk about the subsidies part, and I have put in some of the negotiation strategies which you need to keep in uh, mind when you are negotiating with the state government. Uh, giving a small chart for your reference as a comparative between Karnataka, Andhra, Telangana, and Tamil Nadu. What is important to understand on this particular chart is that this chart is talking about what is there in the policy. Anyone can look at and see what is there in the policy. But when I say that you can get back 150% of your investment from the state government, it's all about customization, which is not coming in this chart because none of the customized packages are there in the public domain except the state of Andhra and Madhya Pradesh who put the customized packages in the public domain. Saying so, that's all from my end. Back to Niyati. Thanks, Saurabh. Thanks for the insights. Uh, once again, just to remind you, if you have questions for our panelists, please do put it in the Q&A section and we will take it up towards the end. Uh, I'd now like to invite Manoj Goel, MD and Head of Global Market and Corporate Sales, to cover the macro e overview as well as financing. Manoj, over to you. Hi, a, a very good evening to all our participants uh, and uh, quite interesting conversation so far. So taking over from uh, what Sujit and uh, Sora was, you know, providing uh, how to go about investing in the schemes and the dynamics. But I think uh, the question on everybody's mind is, of course, yes, that's all good. But what's happening in the economy uh, and, and you're looking to invest in the country for some years, how is that looking like what has been the impact of COVID, etc.? So maybe over next uh, seven, eight minutes, uh, that is the topic I would like to cover on what is happening, what government is trying to do, what RBI is trying to do, what's happening in the rates market and uh, interest rate and currency markets as well. Uh, I try not to use this slide. Maybe I'll just talk through, uh, you know, some of my thoughts. So the first question about what's happening in the economy. Uh, Clearly, if I if I go back uh, start of this year, uh, the economy was uh, looking like uh, going very strong. Uh, the specifically from Jan to uh, March uh, quarter, uh, the economic parameters which are coming out were very very robust. Uh, most of the economists across you know uh, across spectrum were looking at something like 12 to 14 percent of uh, economic growth uh, for the country for financial year uh, 2021 to 22. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, that was pre-COVID, uh, pre-second wave uh, of COVID. And as uh, all of us know, you know, we have gone through very strong COVID uh, uh, second wave. Uh, we're still at the fag end of that. I wouldn't say that if the, if the wave is over, uh, there's all likelihood, uh, you know, uh, possibility of a third uh, strong wave as well. Uh, but 
just now commenting back uh, the impact of second uh, wave and quite possible not many people had factored in such a strong wave um, and, and that can be looked back when i talk about you know what government has been doing the budget uh, announcements etc i don't think a lot of this had been factored in uh, but the key question here is yes we sec we have gone through the second wave what is the impact where are we heading uh, from here now when we look at what is the difference between this covid wave and the last time around uh, there are some very very uh, key differences and last year we know you know while the country went uh, quite in strong lockdowns and the economy activity was quite strongly impacted around the time but once the uh, we were out of the first covid wave we saw very very strong uh, recovery uh, pent up demand coming in the question right now is are we going to see a repeat or this time the growth could be muted and we can have a larger impact so let me talk about some of the differences uh, from last time around first of all i think the uncertainty of the lockdown uh, because this has been going on it's not a notion national wide lockdown but it's a uh, state wise localized lockdown which is good the economic activity had, hasn't come to a stand still like the like the last time around but this is very uncertain one because you are not under a notion national lockdown Uh, in various bits and pieces the uh, lockdown continues like if, if in why no in for for example right now in bombay also the you know there's no dine in or, or the market has to be closed by 4 pm so those are some of the thing uh, which comes in at the same time if you don't know how long this is going to last you know the planning the the logistic everything you know comes to stand still so while the overall country is not a full lockdown which is good but at the same time the uncertainty continues that can continue for a longer period of time the second part is uh, clearly the impact uh, and the uh, on various section of the society last time around uh, pretty much uh, i would say the middle or higher income uh, strata of the society was pretty much relatively left untouched by covid first wave and we we, we saw the impact happening more to the uh, uh, the relatively poorer people but this time that was not the case you know all of us know how you know i'm sure all of us around here would have uh, either being you know impacted by this or close friend family etc have been impacted uh, this has going the, the the question here is what is going to do on demand especially on discretionary demand the luxury demand i think that is where i think there are some apprehension that last last time we see after the covid wave was uh, over a strong consumption demand which had come around uh, this time there are apprehensions around there third is of course a rural impact last time again the rural economy was pretty much left unscathed by this but this time uh, there is uh, the it has been as prevalent in the rural area as in the urban area so you will be likely to see much more impact on the rural side last important point is of course scar from last year you know it it's uh, all this measure what government had done last year the rbi etc everything support was to, to cope up with first uh, wave uh, those scars are not uh, you know yet over and we don't know what is the impact and then we have the second wave uh, so those are something which you know we are going to see but if i look at these are some of the apprehension where we say yes the impact will be you know the the growth will be impacted but at the same time uh, if you look at the activity parameters etc a uh, good thing is they have started to pick up uh, the lockdown and uh, you know the impact was not as much as last time around last time our you know activity tracker which we track which is a combination of uh, let's say go google mobility electricity consumption where is the parameter uh, you know the economy has come down something like 40 to 45% if i take 100 as the you know normal operating economy this time around the, the low we have seen is around 62% 63% somewhere around that range and now you know those parameter level back to you know above 90% somewhere in 92 to 95% so that is a good part uh, some of the uh, activity levels let's say if, if if i talk about which are going through our counters and we being one of the largest you know bank in the country uh, i would say represent a fair section of uh, economic activity and uh, uh, i think the activity has been robust of course not to the extent of you know what it has been on the january or february level but still uh, you know uh, not not so bad given the overall consideration many of the economists have called for the base level at 8% growth for the year uh, but if some of the economic data continues to come slightly stronger in next few months maybe we may see some upside on those uh, economic forecast and uh, maybe reaching towards uh, 10% now if i look at combination of two years like last year we have pretty much negative growth close to minus 7 7.2% this year if you're talking about 8 8 8 to 9% also you know in two years we're talking about maybe pretty much we are we are there where we were 
and uh, you know there is some going to be some impact of what has happened uh, uh, from the scar the the bankruptcies you know the leverage which has been built in uh, all those things will come to come into play and one important part which you need to keep in mind is uh, you know uh, while many of the let's say if you look at the stock indexes other thing we are talking about uh, the uh, parameters which may be representing more of the organized sector clearly they can be much more impact on the unorganized sector now having said you know this is a back uh, backdrop let's look at what rbi is doing what government of india is doing and how that's going to impact uh, the rate and uh, you know interest rate market so coming back from rbi perspective clearly i think they did play a very large part last year around on trying to stabilize the economy bringing in liquidity when it was really cutting rates coming out of their is moratorium etc i think they did what many central banks have been doing across the across the globe before the second wave hit there was talk about they looking to normalize uh, liquidity uh, and maybe of course rate cut might have been rate hike might have been slightly away but clearly there was talk of uh, reducing liquidity in the market uh, which i think at the time of second wave they have come out very strongly to suggest that you know clearly between uh, growth and other some other aspect they will continue to focus on growth and try to support as much as they could which means the rate hikes may be some time away pretty much we can meet current uh, rate scenario Uh, but two things which uh, they are worried about and, and need to watch about is one uh, inflation as uh, across the globe we have and i'm sure some of you would be seeing that directly in your commodity input prices the inflation has been picking up uh, quite uh, significantly across the globe and uh, the question and maybe i i think the central bank across the globe are hoping that it may be transitory uh, but more and more uh, people are coming around may not be transitory and it may be uh, you know a bit more uh, long drawn uh, inflation which they need to grapple with while we don't expect central bank to you know really act uh, and and start focusing fully on inflation right now but sooner or later it will start coming and more in uh, prominence second part is of course uh, global liquidity uh, which has direct impact on money flowing into emerging markets such as india and that is where we are seeing maybe bit of uh, impact or uh, as uh, us fed is talking about uh, uh, nominalizing liquidity or you know they are talking about tapering the qe program or or even talking about rate hike that has a repercussion for the entire uh, you know uh, global market so those are some of the thing which may would make uh, rbi job uh, a bit more uh, difficult but it will be fair to say that we are not seeing too much of uh, ch- expect don't expect too much of change in in rate environment for for a while for next quarter to two quarter but after that uh, you know we may see rbi has to act uh, to control uh, inflation Uh, from a government of india perspective clearly they have been focusing on uh, you know creation job and and schemes such as this you know plis etc are something where they are looking uh, you know to kick start the economic activity create jobs and slightly think from a medium uh, you know to long term perspective uh, they did uh, you know uh, come around and take some uh, strong decision around the last budget where they you know focus a lot more not so much on fiscal deficit but uh, focusing on growth of course second wave is making life slightly difficult but at the same time we are seeing strong uh, tax collection both direct and indirect which may be provide them uh, some uh, space uh, over there last last point i want to touch upon was currency market uh, you know rupee has been very very stable when we look at what has been happening to some of the other currency last year rupee pretty much moved around uh, against dollar at 73 to 75 uh, this year also it has been around there by lately it has started to move uh, slightly higher it has moved towards 74 half but that is where pretty much it has been uh, uh, moving around what we believe is as the uh, economic activity has picked up uh, the oil prices have picked up and they have you know moved around the 70 75 uh, dollar range per barrel uh, on, on oil prices uh, it means our trade deficit may not be too benign uh, and uh, Uh, we may be slightly deficit on current account which means that we need to again go back as a country on more uh, what's happening on the portfolio flow and on the fdi flows which i think will be more similar to what you know is something like 2019 not something like 2020 where we see where we saw record inflow uh, so if you look at an overall perspective maybe we look at a scenario where uh, currency maybe you know something like 2 rupee depreciation in a year you know around 2 and a half 3% depreciation which is more line in inflation differential or less than that but interest rate differential is something uh, you know we may uh, see happening uh, so overall if i summarize i think yes economic activity is looking to pick up maybe we'll see uh, growth inching somewhere between 8 to 10% uh, depending on how uh, you know uh, activity pick up uh, stable rate environment uh, inflation being a very uh, relatively more uh, stable currency i will maybe just stop over there from an uh, you know uh, macro overview 
just last point which I wanted to touch upon is a bit on you know financing options and clearly that is one topic which will be on everybody's mind when they're looking to invest in India. What should be the mechanism? How do they go about? Where do they raise financing? Uh, there are two parts to it. One is clearly looking at equity versus debt and that's a separate decision. decision. But specifically on the part around, uh, you know, if you're looking to raise debt, uh, various alternative available. Of course, uh, there is offshore, uh, you know, uh, 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 routes available, there are onshore routes. And more importantly, you can also finance if, especially if, you know, we have you, uh, foreign investors looking to invest in India uh, through parental debt where, you know, the offshore uh, entity can uh, finance uh, pretty much its uh, onshore subsidiary uh, through an intercompany financing. I mean, there, there are a lot of nuances around over there. Uh, I would not go in the interest of time over there, but just I want to leave around. There are various options available for you to choose. You need not rely only on the domestic INR financing. If you believe you like to use your global dollar liquidity pool, uh, there are ways and means which you can finance practically for most of the purposes which you have. And if you have foreign currency financing, there are hedging routes available uh, You know to manage the currency risk. Uh, I will just uh, stop over there and uh, pass it back to Nyati. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to Mansi Pandey, Director and Head, International Subsidies Banking Mumbai, who will do the closing remarks and then address your question and answers. Mansi, over to you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Neeti, for that. And, uh, you know, I, I thought maybe, you know, we've heard, of course, uh, we have fairly good insights, detailed insights from Sujit Saurabh and uh, Manoj. And uh, we thought we'd invite in some of our industry captains itself. So we, we do have uh, Himanshu Patel, who's joining us. He, he's the, the CEO of Triton Electric and uh, based out of New York. And uh, we also have Dr. Sailesh Upriti, uh, who is the CEO of uh, C4V, again, a New York-based uh, you know, energy storage major. And we have both of them on this call, so I'd, I'd really like to kind of draw them into the conversation as well, uh, because a lot of the, uh, the policy chirps that we've heard today, I think they are really going to live and breathe it. Um, so welcome, uh, Himanshu and Sailesh. Uh, thank you, Manshi. Right. Uh, you know, maybe what I do is I'll just probably pose a common question to both of you and, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, jump in with, uh, you know, your inputs. Uh, both of you, of course, are uh, from related industries, which are kind of joined at the hip. And, uh, you know, as you make this transition on your journey into India, uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of opportunity on the card, but there are also comparisons uh, or other learnings from other markets that you would kind of bring forth in this journey. So I'd love you to really... Uh, speak through on the opportunity by itself, including policy, including talent, and of course, the need for technology innovation, um, given that India is otherwise used to a fairly low cost mobility, uh, you know, economy per se. So really your thoughts on, uh, on those aspects there, and maybe we can start with Himanshu first. Sure, thank you. You know, there are two multiple components on that part, right? Um, in, the, in the part of the perspective that, you know, the, the cost effectiveness, I think people are now willing to take a different approach. They understand the, 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 the cost uh, that can be offset. Uh, this is what we're seeing, at least, that uh, people are willing to look at it in a different perspective, saying, hey, look, the fuel cost is uh, going up day by day. It's not changing. And the people have got the taste of uh, the uh, of clean energy, uh, clean environment a little bit, and they see that there is a there is a future to the clean environment, um, as well as they see that okay, you know if there is a, a a perspective of the government pushing the policies, everyone is looking at it in a in a different perspective in that sense, right? Um, we have seen that okay, a, a semi truck. We're in the semi truck, electric semi truck manufacturing, so. The same truck that was diesel, which is, goes for you know a hundred thousand US dollars, they're willing to pay the one fifty, and I, I I really feel that that that's coming from the perspective that at the end of the day they can uh, have the capex on uh, you know the cost difference between the diesel versus to you know an electric, and that has become more practical now, right? Uh, originally there was no uh, differences or somebody was not educating them. 
And at the same time, they didn't look at that there was a possibility of uh, uh, lowering the environment. After the pandemic, and uh, you know the, the, the spike that had happened in the in the U.S. as well, which um, really triggered the world to start looking at it differently. And that's kind of now making people like wonder, hey, do we do we start moving into that clean energy? Is this the right time to do it? And it's, if the U.S. is doing it and other countries are doing it, it just started becoming that trend of saying, hey, electric is possible. Electric is something that we should look at and consider as there might not be a diesel truck available on, on the road. Um, and so everybody's in that run of the race as well as giving uh, the uh, the companies who are using these commercial vehicles um, a, a, a way to target of saying, okay, we're a clean energy company, we're willing to move forward that way. Um, it's also spending, you know, utilizing their marketing money in the, in the right format. So, I, you know, you're going to start seeing that component happening on a daily basis, guys. Um, and financing has become much easier as, as in like dollar as interest wise. And that's also triggering in the U.S. market uh, the allowing of the financing of those vehicles to become at like a one or two percent, uh, and, and in some cases even zero percent at a consumer level. On a uh, on a, a commercial level, it's gone down to one or two percent, and that's allowed uh, co commercial industries to really such adapt and pick up that uh, electric vehicle. Um, I know we've picked up just recently. Uh, roughly about $2.4 billion worth of uh, uh, irrevocable purchase orders from India alone, which is, was very shocking to us that it came in during, during this pandemic. Um, and people are really just trying to move forward and really want to try to see how they can actually do, make a difference in, their, in on their books. So I think that that is also happening, that they're looking at it in a long-term future, uh, 10, 15 years, and being able to say, okay, well, we, we got to figure out how to manage our finances in a better way than, you know, spending it on diesel. Right. No, I mean, I absolutely hear you there. And, you know, that's that's really a consumer change also that India has to really, you know, chart the process for. Um, you know, Dr. Dr. Upruti, if I were to loop you in here, and I, I know over the last decade you've, um, you know, you've invested or you rather you've had a lot of iterations on learning on technology. And, um, and clearly supply chain resilience is something that you've worked on very actively, you know, in, in your uh, energy storage uh, efforts. And there's a question in the question and answer module, I think it's the first question which has come in on, you know, whether the 60% um, uh, you know, value addition can be achieved in, um, you know, in five years. So I'd really, you know, love to hear from you on otherwise the, you know, the India opportunity as well as this question. If I could pose it to you, um, you know, I, 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 we don't see it happening, Mansi. We we don't see that sixty percent market can be achieved, and the reason why we feel that way is there's not that many EV segments that can actually transit that quickly, and due to the fact of one one reason alone, China has been working on picking up the raw materials for the last, uh, you know, seven to ten years now, right? India is just trying to get into it, right? This is a, a play that should have happened, you know, five years ahead of this point in order for that market to hit. Um, raw material today is easily accessible now uh, from certain markets. Today, we have our own source of raw materials, Monty. Um, you know, okay. we get our, our raw materials out of, uh, we have secured it out of Morocco, as well as uh, Peru, as well as uh, Congo. Um, we've secured our, our lithium and cobalt and uh, other raw materials that are required, uh, which is to make the battery cells. Um, but we don't see that it, it can be produced fa fast enough to, to take that 60% market. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. Uh, I, cell manufacturing uh, is very complicated process. And that's why there is no one uh, doing it in India today. And this is very much what's happening in the U.S. I would say last, I would call it you know, last 10, 15 years. Obviously, Tesla did it, but primarily Panasonic that was leading and majority of the raw material and machinery still came from overseas, right? And C4V that has been working on, on this for the last 10 years, today is the third largest giga factory in the U.S. after Tesla and LG. And we're proudly producing these batteries with 90% local content, right? 
and it goes back to technology obviously today's batteries require cobalt and nickel one of the key challenges where and how you will resource them from that's why i think the advanced chemistry outlook uh, that we saw from the niti aayog and and the overall policies around and i think it's a very we have been part of those discussions uh, you know with, with the niti aayog in past i think it is very good uh, strategy for longer term uh, you know adoption and the cost reduction of the evs and we believe companies like us and there are many more who can bring the 60% local content even day one i think the need is to really bring the industrial cluster uh, you know companies who understand the ecosystem as well as the complicated manufacturing so for us the advantage is not having cobalt nickel we have been working with end to end you know value chain for last four years in india uh you know have signed several contracts but also signed and qualified uh, raw material supplier india is third largest in graphite india is globally known for polymer you know polymer is uh, one of the critical component at separator so the when when we talk about value add i think it's not just the raw material itself is the overall uh, you know value that will be added to the cell level right so if you making slurries if you making uh, doing all your assembly formation in country that's right there is 25 to 30% value add if you bring either cathode or one of the anode separate electrolyte component that's right there is you know 60% all i'm saying and for us we have several agreements in place to uh, but we don't have to bring any overseas manufacturer the the, the qualifying qualifications we have done in india for the component itself will get us in that 60% mark and we recently announced that uh, we will be setting up a uh, 5 gigawatt hour in karnataka sign the mou with the karnataka government as well and uh, our goal is to bring that uh, 60% within first year forget about 5 year 5 year we were we are aiming to uh, get to 90% and bring the cost down at the pack level to 100 dollars per kilowatt hour and i think that's very much necessary to really compete with with the larger uh, you know producers today uh we have to uh, break the 3 gigawatt hour production mark to get there uh but in in bigger context i think end of the day the cell going to be the heart and brain brain of the vehicle and uh you know 30 to 50% depending upon the vehicle the cost goes back to the battery so having a significant cost reduction in battery eventually going to help oems uh to reduce the vehicle cost and that will eventually uh, i think increase the adoption as well and obviously simultaneously government policies around the charging stations are are very very attractive with the fame to uh, policies you know i thought, i think there is a lot of uh, i would say energy in oems because we have been interacting with at least 40 plus oems in indian market so everyone wants to get into ev everyone has a prototype development program everyone is looking into how and where they can source local cells so my understanding and my feeling even if you don't achieve 60% you become one of the early mover in cell manufacturing the market will support you because there is lot upstream downstream benefit in the industry any way respective so uh, i wouldn't just stick to the 60% these things could change as well but i still uh, believe that these numbers are achievable if if the right chemistry right technology is qualified approved under these pro- programs and a bigger vision of industrial cluster and end to end control over the value chain is again uh, you know subsidized and and incentivized by government like they have been doing under fem2 already downstream so that's just my my overview because i come from the cell manufacturing background and and i've been doing this for 20 plus years uh, so so i feel this is uh, very much uh, doable to to greater extent No, no. I think the 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 good thing to have is a healthy debate, you know. So it's always good to have different perspectives. So, so thank you to both of you for that. Uh, I'm going to now uh, join uh, Sujith. Uh, you know, we we do have a question uh, from Kedar Vele, and you know, the question is directed to Sujith on similar lines, where you know they're wondering if there will be stakeholder discussions. for material suppliers you know obviously this is to do with supply chain you know ecosystem for uh, you know the battery storage and would niti aayog uh, be involved in further localization discussions which would help the whole process of uh, achieving the value addition uh, sujeet yeah thank you mansi thank you hanshu and shailesh to be honest shailesh answered most of my questions and i guess he made it very clear that how the value addition and everything has to be achieved 
and his point was very clearly mentioned right okay so when you speak about value addition today if i say clearly 25% you are in a country right now also can easily achieve the the whole thing and the whole competition or the whole push of the government is on achieving 60% of the value addition and like selesh i know he has been one of the pioneer in the market for the batteries last 20 years this guy has done wonders so when it's like kind of an acknowledgement and that kind of a faith coming from a us player and congratulations to him to able to con- complete the deal with the karnataka on a 4000 crore battery segment part so i just look forward to all the things and support from himanshu as well and achalesh as well i'm open to discussion on that part now coming back to your second question on the regarding the uh, dis- raw material discussion on the so this was uh, asked by whom let me have a look ஆசன்ஸ்ரேட்டிங்ஸ்ரேட்டிங்ஸ்ரேட்டிங்ஸ்ரேட்டிங்ஸ்ரேட்டிங்ஸ்ரேட்டிங்ஸ்ரேட்
So if you see that all the RFP or model document, they have very clearly defined land of law role. And then that clause has to be followed by any Chinese or the countries which we share border with. And they have right. to ask for the Ministry of Finance and the Department of DEA and Economic Affairs. They have to follow those guidelines. They have to submit the respective undertakings and documents. And if they are the ones who have got through the QCBS mechanism, they will get awarded. Nothing stopping by. Right. Right. No, I think that's that's pretty clear, Sajid. No, thank you for your patience. And, um, you know, before we draw to a close, I'd really like to thank on all, all our panel participants today for their uh, candid views and ideas. And clearly you, it's Martin. an opportunity. Uh, yeah, it's clearly an opportunity. I think the EV space as well as the energy storage space is really going to be fast paced for the next decade for India. And while there are clear opportunities on climate, uh, you know, climate controls, etc., uh, there will be challenges. And I guess, uh, you know, the key to meet them is going to be through policy interventions. It's probably going to be through supply chain resilience that Sailesh and Himanshu spoke of. And uh, of course, in terms of technology innovations. Uh, for HSBC, we personally very strongly believe that this isn't a uni you know, unidirectional arrow. It's, uh, it's absolutely like a circle and every part counts. So, you know, thank you again for tuning in today. And if there are any questions and if you need to reach Sujith or Saurabh or the other panelists, you know, please do drop us a line and uh, have a good rest of the day. Yeah, just uh, one minute. I will just take a time and I just want to thank everyone sure, really from an HSBC team, Mohit, Raghav, Mansi, you, Neerthi, and everyone has been a great support and Saurabh being a friend. I just thank him enough that the way he has put the question at the same way, asking me the same thing. It's, well, I like the way he always bring the right thing at the right place. And then I look forward to players and the private players being into it, like Himanshu and everyone. And thank you so much. You have done a great work. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Have a good evening.